from the combined crew of blindandroidusers.com and accessibleandroid.com, it's time for your favorite Android podcast. Kick back now and enjoy another fine episode from these fanboys and gals as they navigate Android from a blindness perspective. And now, here's your crew. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 159 of the Blind Android Users Podcast. We're recording today on Saturday, December the 23rd, 2023. Two days before Christmas, is that two turtle doves or is it three French hens? But we're recording today, the 23rd of December, 2023. I'm Warren Carr. I'm Austin Pinto from Mumbai. I'm John Dyer from Virginia. Thank you, Juan. from Turkey. And we do have a special guest. We've got someone from Slovakia, Rastislav. I really like that name. And Rastislav is going to be talking about the R-Scan, something we've been talking about on our email list. And we're so delighted that Rastislav is joining us today to talk about the R-Scan. Rastislav, welcome and say hello to the people. Hello, everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, appear on this podcast. So thanks, Warren, for uh, giving me an invitation. You are welcome. Let's do some well check. Austin Pinto, what's going on in Mumbai? I know you can't wait for that Christmas. You've kind of got the bottle out there already and all of that stuff. What's up with you? So Mumbai is fully getting ready for Christmas, and uh, the temperature has dropped. And I am um, recording the podcast with a cup of beer in front of me and some nice uh, rice and pork dinner. So it's a nice uh, pre-Christmas dinner here. So I'm eating and recording at the same time. That's so selfish. Uh, Austin, you didn't even invite any of the podcasts. No, all are, all are ready to come. You. Definitely come on, all man. can come. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, till you all reach here, the dinner won't last, unfortunately. Of course. Uh, John, what's going on in Virginia land? It's going good. Um, I guess I'm ready for Christmas. We're going to have a busy weekend. Got to visit my brother tonight. Then we got the in-laws tomorrow. And then my parents are coming over on Christmas. So the usual. Let's move on to the pretty girl. Carrie, what's going on in Lebanon? First, I want to say... Um... That I wasn't able to be in the celebration last week. So uh, I wish the podcast a lot of successful years. And uh, then everything is going well here. Uh, this week is better than the uh, previous week. And uh, we are having, actually, uh, officially, the, uh, the, rain, the winter season had started. So, and we are having uh, some heavy rain. Uh, so it's, it's um, a great start, I, I can say. Sally, pretty boy, what's going on? Doing well, just being pretty in some meeting every day. <laughs> you know, as Karine said, you know, it's also winter in here and we are having a heavy storm right now. It's just started and it's blowing wind and I hope everyone is safe outside. I'm I'm really feeling sorry for those working outside when it's in heavy, heavy rain or storm. So, yeah, while I'm having my warm coffee or tea. They are, they are always working hard. And then I want to congratulate my good friend, Corinne, for having a new connection because you can hear, see, you can hear her more stable, isn't it? Is it really better? It's much better. Yeah, because yeah. there's not been a single uh, breakup uh, after getting the new yeah, connection. Yeah, yeah. I'm super stable. happy for it. And I was going to ask That's you great. about it. You know, yeah. Kerry, you did mention about having a new internet connectivity, and I didn't, you know, realize you've gotten that because I wasn't paying attention, and definitely that's better. So we're so excited you have a different provider and now making you more stable than before, and now we could have those parties without any concern. Yeah, I'm glad that you are really noticing the difference, <laughs> and I'm too noticing the difference, actually. It, it is more stable. It, it sure is. Sounds really good. So Warren, tell us, how is Christmas in Washington? 
Well, we're anxiously looking for Christmas a couple of days before Christmas. And like I said, is it uh, two turtle doves or is it three French hens? Uh, so you guys remember that song, you know, 12 days of Christmas. So we're up, you know, two more days before Christmas. Uh, I can't believe it's already almost Christmas. Uh, kids are anxiously waiting for it. For me, I really don't care necessarily. Um, I know all that they want. It's all the gifts and all that Christmas tree has been up for like over a week now or two weeks. And so that's what's going on. And for some reason today, we have a clear weather. The sun is actually out. You can see the sun out today, unlike the other days. So this is something to be thankful for uh, because usually this time of year is just awfully bad. But I'm glad we see the sunshine out there today. So that's what's going on. My family's, uh, my wife rather, is not home. She's celebrating Christmas in Ohio. So I'll be celebrating Christmas without my wife this year. Very interesting. Other than that, that's all that we have. Well, welcome to episode 159, guys. So coming up, this is what we've got. We've got the spotlight on Rice's lab. We got the app of the week. And Karen brings us something from CSR, the confused screen reader. She might as well chop my head off. And then we conclude the episode with a tip of the week. That's what we've got in store for you. And if you're celebrating Christmas, we want to say Merry Christmas. We don't say Happy Holidays. You want to say Happy Holidays. You can. That's your choice. But Merry Christmas from BAU and Accessible Android. We are saying Merry Christmas to all of you that celebrated. And if you celebrate something else, we want to say happy whatever it is that you celebrate. Welcome to episode 159. This is the Spotlight segment. Stay tuned for premium interviews, device unboxing, and more. Let's now move on to the R-Scan, and I want to welcome our guest, Rastasnap. Rastasnap, how about you go ahead and tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're located, and then we'll get to talking about the R-Scan, which I believe the R there in that scan represents your name. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Well... Okay, so to start about uh, a little bit about uh, my background. So my name is uh, Rastislav Kish. A blind, uh, blind listeners of this podcast might know me from various uh, blind-related mailing lists and forums. And uh, well, what to say about me? I'm sort of hard to classify person. Uh, I have finished. Uh, I have finished uh, high school like two years ago, and. Uh, now, well, I, I have uh, I have gone to uh, study to a university, and I I was studying uh, theoretical mathematics for a while, but uh, then I have decided that I want uh, something uh, something more challenging, so uh, I have cancelled my study, and uh, right now uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, mostly working, doing some some programming programming work. So I can get uh, funds for further further study. So that's sort of my my uh, my personal life. But uh, probably for for our audience, more most more interesting is uh, my software production. That's what you, people usually know me uh, by. Uh, when you you can you can find my creation on my uh, github profile uh, and uh, i i really i i really you know i have a lot of ideas and a lot of projects in mind so i i really love to uh, to get those done and i also love exploration and sharing my experiences i have been uh, traveling uh, traveling uh, around the the world like like in individually visiting various countries as a blind person and uh, writing about it so it's it's very diverse uh, my background is very diverse so uh, so are the interests so wh whatever you like <laughs> it's probably supported <laughs> 
Well, rest is love. This is absolutely beautiful. Just knowing that you just graduated from high school like a couple of years ago and you are into all of these things. And what I find interesting is that, you know, you actually are not finding math challenging enough for you. Here, I was struggling with math more than anything else. I, I mean, I'm absolutely lousy at math and probably was the worst <laughs> subject I ever had to work with was math and whoever invented math <laughs> I don't know what they were drinking but uh, uh, I'm so excited to see someone uh, a blind person uh, you know liking math and doing things like that I mean it simply blows me away and so we're happy to have you here and so we're going to talk about your scanner um, the QR code scanner barcode scanner uh, let's talk about this. Uh, why did you start uh, doing this uh, or what led you to inventing or rather uh, developing uh, the R scanner? Were you kind of not satisfied with some of the solutions we've got out there or what was some of the things or um, were some of these things that led you to thinking, hey, you know what, I just want to do something else and see how it, how it works or um, were you just uh, kind of not very satisfied with some of the solutions out there? Yes, indeed. That that that's how most of the inventions are done. <laughs> so, uh, basically, mm, well, this uh, uh, the Arscan project started a uh, uh, few years ago when I was still on the high school, and uh, the reason was very simple because you see, my brain my brain works on sweets. Yes, like I need sugar and uh, especially chocolate. Thank you. Uh, for my brain to <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> to to work properly and and uh, so uh, at home we had like a like like a box like a, a cartoon box that uh, uh, ha has been always like filled with various chocolates and uh, other sweets and I would always uh, go and get one but uh, there was always the problem that I. I never knew, I never knew, uh, like, which chocolate is, like, which, right? So you can, uh, sometimes you can tell, uh, like, approxim do an approximation uh, based on the on the shape of the chocolate. Exactly. But uh, there are, especially, especially if you have multiple chocolates of the same brand, mm -hmm. then it can be literally impossible to, to determine the flavor and, and other parameters uh, without without like technique so then we had uh, back then we already had uh, lookout if, if i'm right and and these ocr applications so great like i was like okay i'm going to use the, an ocr application and and read what flavor it is well that worked when uh, the name of the chocolate and the flavor was written on the front side on the on the Freud front side and uh, it was the it it was readable and uh, it was the only information there right yeah and uto an utopic scenario <laughs> like uh yes sometimes it it works but many, many times uh, it uh, it just can't read what's in the front side because you know there's always some fancy graphics and uh, yeah. colorful, colorful uh, fonts, and and uh, so you get you get either nothing at all, or you get uh, you get like the the brand name, but uh, not the specific not the specific flavor. It's it's even worse. It's even worse with chips and various bags that are like that have like curved sur surface, and uh, and reading those can be really a pain. So. Then, then you are like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the chocolate around, and uh, there is more information written on the on the back side. So, well, probably there, but yes, okay. But you do that, and you do an OCR, and then you are getting, uh, getting a description uh, on how to on on what's the chocolate composed of in like twenty different languages. And uh, like <laughs> you are, you are getting the information about 
about all the all the chemicals that are in the chocolate, about uh, all the all the uh, you know sh sugar and uh, and fat uh, information and calories. You get everything except the flavor, right? Because yeah. Why not? So, <laughs> so th this was this was really something uh, pretty annoying, and uh, I was like, okay, this is uh, not an ideal way to go, but. I was like, wait a minute! Like every single product has an uh, has an uh, unique identifier placed right on it, uh, and that is the barcode. Right? Every product uh, that's being sold on the market needs to have a barcode, and barcodes are plus specially made, so they are easy. They would be easy to read by machines, right? So. This was sort of like a very easy connection. So, okay, so let's let's make a software that would uh, uh, scan the barcode and read right away uh, what what was the product. So that's that's how how our scan uh, started as a project. Uh, my initial my initial idea was that uh, it would be uh, simply uh, based on uh, on my uh, own labeling uh, because. Uh, you know, there there was uh, just a certain uh, certain set of 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 sweets that I have uh, consumed like most often. So uh, it would even even manual label labeling would would uh, quite work because well, perhaps it would be good to mention for people who are, who are uh, not into this that uh, uh, the barcodes that are placed on uh, uh, on uh, the products are. Uh, just identifiers. They don't carry information about the the product itself. Uh, their uh, barcode is just just a number uh, that comfort that uh, that acts as an identifier for for a product. But uh, and it's unique for that product. But uh, there is no like central database that would be that would uh, contain the information about uh, uh, what that number uh, is assigned to. At least not in in the with the European barcodes. So, uh, uh, well, yes. Uh, so, the first version of our scan was uh, working based on manual lab labeling, and uh, and yes, it it worked. It worked really great. And then uh, then uh, the usefulness of this application has uh, even increased when I. Uh, got to uh, when I went studying to university. University, and uh, I, I have got uh, my own uh, like rented uh, like rented flat, and uh, in the flat, uh, like in Bratislava, I was I was living like completely on my own, uh, and now you know, uh, being a student, I was I was the kind of person who who was too busy to do cooking. But at the same time, I didn't have enough money to to afford like you know full fledged restaurants. Uh, that's <laughs> probably a dilemma of every student out there, uh, especially with the prices that we have today. That's absolutely crazy. So uh, yes, uh, so my the way uh, the way uh, that my uh, you know uh, eating works. Is basically like pants and uh, Wario's Wario's uh, half products. So, and in this setting, it was uh, our scan became even even more more important because I have ordered. Uh, I was usually doing uh, food orders for uh, time intervals about uh, one or two weeks, and uh, I have usually had at least one or two. Uh, cans per day of uh, of something so i have made an order in the shop and i have received uh i have received two bags of like 30 cans 15 to 30 cans and uh, there was a need to to sort them out if efficiently and uh, uh then uh, and and then our scan become became very 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 useful and uh, I have implemented. I have implemented uh, 
and special algorithm into the application that uh, could uh, simply search out the barcode on the internet and just tell me uh, and, and just choose the description automatically for me right uh, so there was no no longer the need for the need for manual labeling because i have noticed that uh, whenever i whenever i uh, search for a barcode online like on google or or DuckDuckGo, then uh, you you got like uh, you got like uh, plenty of results and uh, mostly mostly uh, you have somewhere in the results also the the product that's that's assigned uh, for the barcode because various e-shops and sellers uh, are publishing this information uh, and now I was like uh, at at first I was not sure if. Uh, how to how to process this information because we did not have uh, we did not have like chat gpt uh, back in in what year is it was 2021 uh, so that there was no technology that you could uh, that that could efficiently process human language but uh, i have noticed that uh, like in 95% of 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 cases whenever you are scanning something uh, there is usually some kind of measure associated associated with that item so example for example if you are scanning a bottle then you usually get a volume of the of the bottle in in its description if you get uh, if you get uh, for example a chocolate then you uh, then you get also the information uh, of how of, of the weight of the chocolate right like whether it's 100 grams or or 300 grams on or or what wave and and this is this is the case with most of products and i was like okay so wait a second i could use this information and uh, program my application so it would automatically search for uh, search for these for these units right uh, in the in the search results and uh, and if it would favorize these uh, the search results that contain this information then it's very likely that uh, such such search result is the information that you as a user want to hear so uh, yes i have designed this al algorithm that is capable of automatically searching up uh, a barcode on the internet and it works it works really really well i i have to say it like uh, as I mentioned, that uh, I was a very heavy user myself of of R scan because I needed to process every uh, every every order that that I that I'm that I made, and uh, it worked very well. Like really, ninety ninety to ninety five percent of uh, of things I have scanned with it uh, were automatically described without without uh, the need for me to do anything. So uh, this worked out very, very well, actually far better than I have estimated at, at the beginning. And uh, yes, so this is, this is, the, this is the current, current R scan. Uh, it's, it's very efficient, especially if you have many, many items that you need to, to recognize and uh, put in, uh, in grow groups and organize in your, in your, in your storage then our scan is, is very, very good uh, in this regard. And it's far, far faster than, than the, OCR, the OCR solutions uh, uh, are in this use case. Absolutely beautiful. So you know what? I, we will have to demonstrate this for our um, podcast. In other words, we'll have to... Uh, demonstrate the app. You've already given us everything about the app as it is. But let's talk about some mm -hmm. of the things. You're a blind person yourself, which makes it more unique because you know where it hurts. I've always argued that, you know, when a blind person does something, they know where the pen points are, you know, where it hurts the most. And so mm -hmm. uh, you're coming from that background and you know where it hurts. Now, I've heard over and over again, and one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of uh, accessible um, apps, or, you know, for Android or whatever, is that a lot of the people always often complain that 
uh, developing with accessibility in mind is something hard. Now, of course, and you are blind and here you are, you don't even have side to you know use some of the uh maybe the whatever developing tools out there was there any problem for you in making it come uh compatible with the you know our screen readers or in other words making it accessible was there any challenges that you ran into that kind of left you wringing your hand or was it just something that just worked I'm I'm always uh, I'm always very uh, very positive in my reviews of uh, of the uh, Android uh, SDK uh, UI framework uh, for for uh, for non technical listeners of uh, of this podcast uh, uh, I I would like to give such an analo- analogy that uh, uh, building uh, building a software application is uh, sort of similar similar to constructing a building because even if if when you are constructing a building then you are not uh, you are not uh, manufacturing uh, uh, th- there is just a fraction of of components that you are manufacturing yourself and most of the actual building uh, is coming from from components that are already ma- already already made by someone else and you just put them together and create the building, right? It's like bricks and uh, and the rods and uh, I don't know uh, w- uh, planks and whatever is used on in in building things. And it's similar it's similar with uh, with software. Uh, programmers programmers usually don't implement everything uh, everything uh, from scratch when they are developing an application. But they instead try to uh, reuse as much as possible uh, the work done by other developers for for common for the common tasks. Like, for example, if you want to have uh, an application, then you probably want to have uh, have like like a window. In the window, you have you want to have like buttons and edit fields and list views and other components that are the same like in every application so so uh we're very good programmers have already made awesome awesome uh, like uh, frameworks and libraries to deal with these tasks and uh, all you need to do as a programmer is just to take these and use them in 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 your project and uh the good the really good thing about android is that uh from the very start, uh, Android SDK, that's the set of tools that uh, Android developers need to use in order to make Android applications, uh, have been providing uh, have been providing a, a unified framework, a framework for creating these, these user interfaces. And uh, the framework uh, turned out to be good enough that uh, most of Android developers uh, just use it and uh, and uh, and don't have a need to to do some weird workarounds and uh, and other stuff. And given that uh, Google really put uh, apparently really put large effort into making the accessibility of of this framework work, then uh, as a consequence, it's uh, it's pretty easy as far as you use this. Uh, Android provided framework uh, to develop your applications is very easy to get uh, uh, applications accessible, even if it's not your original your original uh, point, right? So that that's really that's really an awesome thing, and uh, you can you can see it in practice that if you compare, for example, uh, Android applications with 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 Windows applications, uh, there is uh, it's much more likely that an android application is going to be uh, accessible or at least uh, usable if not uh, uh, truly accessible like by usable i i mean that you have for example apps with uh, with n- buttons that lack this la- lack description but that's not uh, that's not something that would absolutely prevent you from using the app like you can still figure out what what the unlabeled buttons are doing and uh, just 
just use the app. It would be much worse if the applications, uh, if the buttons in the application were not presented at all to the screen reader, and uh, then like you would be doing what, right? Remembering the locations that would be much more difficult. So uh, many apps in Android are at least usable, if not directly uh, quite well accessible, which is really a great thing compared to, for example, for example, Windows and or or even Linux, uh, like applications that done that are done in in the Q, uh, Qt framework are uh, common in the blind community for their accessibility. But uh, uh, it's is the situ is the situation with many others frameworks desktop. Uh, graphical user interface frameworks that uh, they don't implement accessibility properly uh, or don't implement it at all. And, and in consequence, whatever the, the developers uh, build using these frameworks is just inherently not accessible because, because the components themselves are wrong. But, uh, but on Android, fortunately, it's, it's really as far as you are doing an ordinary an ordinary architecture and not some unusual stuff stuff like with with games or uh, or other special software that that needs special treating of the ui then it's very uh, very likely that an android app is going to be accessible even it's if it's not something that you would uh, consider while developing it wonderful now, so the app, though, like I said, we're going to be demonstrating it, but it's a very simplistic app, for example. Does mm -hmm. one need to, uh, you know, tap anything when you uh, say, like, tech picture or anything like that, or simply just launch the app and point it at the product and keep rotating it till you find what you need? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. This was very, this was, this is always a very important uh, uh, designing uh, consideration, whatever am I uh, am I uh, uh, doing? Because, uh, for example, I, I will give you an application. Uh, I will give you another example. Uh, as a, as my uh, private project, uh, well, as, as a person uh, in in my in the city where where I'm coming from, uh, we have uh, streets where uh, it is very difficult for a blind person. To walk in a straight line, because uh, uh, you know whether, whether you can or cannot maintain a di direction depends partly on uh, on the surface that you are walking on. If it's curvy or or uh, there is there are slopes and uh, whatever fe features, then uh, uh, that's natural uh, changer of of the walking direction. And uh, so I have I have uh, developed for my personal use case an application that uh, allows me to uh, to keep straight direction while walking using my smartphone. Right. So my smartphone is tracking uh, uh, the direction that I'm walking in using a compass. And uh, if I change the direction uh, more than is given threshold. Then it will it will start vibrating and telling me uh, that I have changed my direction and in which di and in which direction I have like uh, that diverged so I can I can return back to the or original line and uh, uh, it was also in in this application a very important aspect for consideration was the convenience because because uh, you know when when you are standing on a uh, on, on a pavement and uh, and you need to cross a road and there are cars waiting and uh, and you might be on an intersection so you need to track traffic lights and uh, you need to uh, keep awareness of your surrounding then you don't have the time uh, or mental resources to play with uh, with uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know touch interface so I have designed the application in such a way that uh, uh, it tracks uh, it tracks the way uh, it, it tracks like uh, the way I'm holding my smartphone or, or its orientation its orientation in space and uh, when I put it in 
straight direction, like uh, uh, in like I point it in front of myself, then uh, the application knows that this is the signal to to fix my current direction, and uh, and from that moment it starts like uh, tracking uh, uh, tracking the direction that I'm walking in, and uh, when I put the smartphone down because this is this is an orientation that's very unusual usual for a smartphone to be in you usually don't use smartphone like this so it's unique and and the fact that's unique is uh, uh, it's the reason why it's great for this use case and so when i cross the road and no longer need the walking correction then i can just uh, put it back uh, back to normal position and uh, it automatically deactivates. So the convenience factor, the convenience factor has always been very important for me as uh, as a developer. Also because I'm as a person very lazy, so I want things to work easily and out of the box. So yes, even even with R scan, I wanted something uh, something to work as quickly as possible and and right away. And without without the need to to do anything special, like just launch the app and and start working. So regarding the tracking the direction using the compass and the tracking the traffic lights, uh, is this a different app or does this uh, get included yes, in yes, our scan? <laughs> yes, yes, that, that's a def, def, that's a different application. Uh, that's my private project. I I don't I don't think I've actually published it. But uh, yeah, th yes, that that's my private project that I have developed uh, when I was going to my uh, to to high school because uh, I I uh, I I have been always uh, I had been like always uh, uh, go going by by foot and uh, my high school was not particular particularly close to my uh, home so uh, I needed to go like through the whole city like. My 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 the city I'm coming from is not like very big, but it's not really small either. So uh, uh, it it took some time and uh, and uh, and had uh, various roads and terrains uh, on 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 my way. So yes, this this was uh, this was uh, my this was my attempt to to make my walks as efficient as as possible so i wouldn't be end up uh, walking like in in the middle of of the roads or or going to to crazy directions so if this app does not use any gps or something it's just uh, sensors in your phone i think you should publish it because it can help a lot of people to track these things yes yes i mean yeah, i i i think that uh, some other other people could absolutely find it useful. Uh, I, I certainly I certainly did. So it it was it was awesome for me. I have uh, the the reason the reason it didn't get uh, published is as with money my projects uh, and that uh, uh, I I'm I, that I start working on on something and uh, then just have a ton of other ideas so i i move on before before absolutely finishing it and uh, and well th there are just there are just so so many so many uh, ideas and awesome things that uh, i'm working on that uh, uh, yes r r r r r nev is the name of the project by the way like see the r naming convention <laughs> and uh, exactly uh, so we yes, it, it, it's a cool project. I really like it. And but the problem is that I have like 20, 20 cool projects on the table. And <laughs> <laughs> you know what, uh, Russ's lab, you just need to uh, kind of bring our nav uh, to the Play Store because I'm sure, like Austin said, I think people yeah, like it, to use it. So it sounds people. like it's something yeah. that is useful uh, in as much as we have the R scan. Uh, if you could bring that also, that would be great. Now, but let's talk about the um, 
uh, the compatibility of our scan. Um, what what's the minimum requirement that one needs? Because you know we have listeners uh, all over the world, and some may be in other countries that could only afford very um, you know low budget phones or you know mid rangers. Uh, what's the minimum um, API that this R scan requires? Um, can one run it like on uh, something, let's say, crazy like a lollipop device, for example? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think I think a lollipop is uh, lollipop would be uh, sort of Android out of the ver range. version version <laughs> five. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that 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 that's really that's really an archaic yeah. <laughs> operating system. Yeah. Although, so what, although what's your target, really... though? I mean, what's what's the lowest target mm -hmm. of of uh, our scan? I mean, like, mm -hmm. uh, the, what's the, the minimum? Uh, what's the lowest uh, target? Is it uh, Pi or is it Oreo or is it Android ten? Uh, I mean, what's the lowest um, uh, target? The, the 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 lowest the lowest target is set to and now i can tell you that it's uh, as far as my memory works well then it's android api version 24 and now if you if you know uh, what android version that means that's great because i don't <laughs> but <laughs> i think but that I, I, 24 I, I, uh, does anyone I, want to take a stab at what API twenty four is? I think it's I, I think it's oh. seven. I think it's Android seven, but I'm so not sure. A, uh, API twenty four is Android Nougat. Yeah, Android you're correct. Is so it's it's Android yeah. seven. That's Nougat. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you have anything lower than Android mm -hmm. Nougat, you know. So if you have Marshmallow or Lollipop and going down and falling back to. Uh, uh, KitKat or something stupid like uh, like that. I mean, even mm -hmm. Google has barred off, uh, you know, KitKat from accessing uh, apps and, and things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, I'm glad to see that, you know, at least the lowest target is Android 7. And I don't know if there are many people out there using Android 7. Most people would have at least Pi, you know, the Android 9 or higher. And so mm -hmm. yes. that's a good target. Yes, it is. Uh, I mean, uh, certainly. I I remember. I remember uh, having uh, having uh, smart watches smart watches from from China uh, from several several years ago that uh, were already running a, a full fledged uh, a full fledged Android eight. Uh, like I think that's Oreo. So yes, when 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 smart watches can uh, for few hundred dollars can. Uh, can run uh, Android A. That I think I think that uh, uh, it's it's really it's really a reasonable reasonable target. That's no no devices with with low with considerably lower Android versions are are relevant by by these days. Okay, first I want to welcome you. Uh, actually, it's great to hear from blind developers, especially at your age, which is I consider it a young age. And I think that um, with time, you will be having really great projects that we should all wait for. Uh, actually, my question is related to Arscan. Um, actually, uh, I wasn't really caring for barcode scanners until Seeing AI. Uh, when Seeing AI was, mm -hmm. was released, uh, it contained something which is the guidance. So when you are closer to the uh, barcode, you will be getting beeps, and the beeps will be quicker and stronger or faster and stronger um, whenever you are uh, coming closer. So, you know, actually, uh, the problem with barcodes that you can't know where the barcode is located, at which side, or even sometimes it's not on, it's not on, the, on the side. So um, <clears throat> I think this guidance is very important for a blind person just to, to know where should I stop or wh where should I start uh, like moving my phone slowly? So is it possible to, to have something similar in your application? This is, this is a very good question. And uh, my answer is that uh, this, this was also a consideration, a consideration back in the days when, uh, when 
Arscan was was being just uh, on a drawing board because you know sometimes sometimes when I get uh, some crazy idea I just come to mailing list and uh, and I'm I'm telling people hey listen I have this fantastic uh, fantastic idea and what would you say if if, if we did this and uh, and would you like it would you use it and and then what would you do else or better or whatever and. Uh, one of the concerns, uh, one of the concerns that I have received from from Czechoslovakian blind uh, people in our communities was that uh, uh, that barcode scanning is like never going to work. Or, well, never going to work. like it's it's not going to be very efficient because blind people uh, will have trouble locating the barcodes, and uh, uh, and I was like uh, like uh, okay, like let's try and let's see what the results are. And uh, I have developed the, the first version of, of RScan, and I have I have based it on uh, Google's uh, MLKit library, that uh, that has an engine for scanning barcodes. And uh, now this and this library is is uh, intended to uh, for computer computer vision tasks. Uh, in other words, uh, like in areas like robotics and and similar. So, in other words, it's designed to be very efficient and very and very uh, uh, very resilient to various uh, visual conditions. For example, uh, to work uh, when you have, for example, the, the barcodes rotated. Yeah, like it's it doesn't matter if if it's upside down on or on 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 its side or whatever. Uh, whatever point you scan or you are scanning from, it, it should it should work. Also, also the light conditions, light conditions, and and similar aspects. And I have I have based based our, our scan on this on this engine, and uh, the result the results are truly amazing. And I really I really recommend uh, uh, you to try it out. And I would love love to hear your opinion uh, because. From from my experience and the uh, experience of other people from Czechoslovakia, uh, the scanning is really crazy, crazily efficient. Uh, it's it literally takes just uh, uh, a magnitude of, of, of seconds, a few, like few seconds, for a blind person to scan a product, because uh, you you like you just get in your hand. Uh, Whatever, like a box or or like chocolate or whatever you are going to scan, you usually you usually have an approximate idea of uh, of where to search where to search for the barcodes. Uh, I have, by the way, uh, uh, written down tips in the re in the readme of the project on my GitHub. So if uh, uh, it, I I was I, I was uh, I, I'm blind from my uh, eleven years. And uh, before that, I was sighted, so I have an approximate imagination of of how how barcodes are located and where. But I have also written down uh, tips for blind people where to start searching on various kind of products. But uh, okay, so uh, regardless of whether you have an idea or 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 not, then it's usually enough to just point your smartphone uh, from from whatever position mm, to the size of to to one of the sides of the products and uh, and in few seconds if, if the barcode is is there it's usually picked picked up right away right so it's it's really uh, from my experience it's really efficient uh, and uh, I often I often for example when scanning uh, when scanning bottles or cans uh, I'm I'm doing it uh, like uh, uh, in such a way that I I take uh, the bottle in one hand I have like in, in my left hand and I take my smartphone in my right hand and uh, I point the camera on the bottle with with my right right hand and then the left hand is just rotating the bottle and uh, of course of course it's it's pretty, it can be pretty clumsy especially if if the if the bottle is full and heavy like 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 one and a half liter bottles can have some weight uh but uh, if even so uh it's usually it usually gets gets uh, the barcode right away 
so it's enough to just just uh, uh, if you can get the object into a position where it will be on the camera, then it will certainly certainly be picked. So uh, I have I have received very positive feedback on this also from from people who are congenitally blind and who who were skeptical about about uh, the performance and the ability to find the barcodes and. Uh, even these these people have written me that uh, that it's uh, it's awesome and it's it's it works really great uh, for them that they, that's very efficient and they can use it. Uh, so yes, it, if you if you get to test it, uh, I would also I would also love to hear your opinion. And if there were if you would think that that it needs some kind of guidance feature, then uh, it, it it absolutely is something that that could be considered. So to be honest, I didn't test the app um, until now. I'm going to, of course, and uh, it should be also reviewed on the accessible Android website. Uh, but actually, um, I was basing my um, or my question uh, on the on the previous uh, tests with other applications. So just to be fair with your app, it, it's not tested yet. Just um, it is based on the lookout tests before and the envision where usually i wasn't going i wasn't getting a good results uh, until as i told you the seeing ai thing so maybe your app will will uh deal with things better so for this reason i should test it of course and see the results as a totally blind person mm -hmm. and i think that what makes the difference is that so if anytime you're using it you know if you're not on a side that has the code uh, it's not going to uh, make any noise or whatever. But, you know, as soon as you rotate that and the uh, barcode or the QR code is in view, it's going to tell you what it is. So um, it just is the same idea. And sometimes, to be honest, I don't like noises. I'm one of those that I'm not into noises, you know, beeps and all of that. And hence the reason why I turn off um you know, what we call the ear cons on my phone. I don't want any of those. So I actually, I think I like the idea of this uh, R scan because I don't want to keep hearing beep, 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 beep until I, I, I got to what I need. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to tell me once that thing is in view. And so I actually, I think I, I prefer your approach. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, yes, as, as I as I mentioned that uh, usually usually when uh, the application when the application doesn't tell you anything, it uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that uh, you are scanning like the barcode in incorrectly that that it that it, it would be in view, but uh, but your smartphone is is not positioned correctly or something like that. But it usually simply means that uh, that the barcode is not on the side. Or, or in the field in the field of view that, that you are scanning, so you can like safely assume. Uh, mostly, you can like safely assume that uh, that that you need to move move further with the scanning. Uh, yeah. And like yes, it, it would it would be probably inappropriate to uh, to say that <laughs> to say that my application is is working. <laughs> better than than all the others or something similar so I, i'm not doing such claims and they would they would be hard to justify or prove or whatever i'm i'm, I'm i would just really uh like uh, uh to hear your feedback that so so far has been very positive when it uh, also when it comes to when it comes to uh scanning feedback and like results and uh yes if, if there are any problems then uh I will be very, very glad to hear hear back. So uh, when when it, it 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 detects the barcode, it will just give you that it is processing, right? So this the, in this way, the person will be able to know that it is now processing the barcode, and if if it it doesn't uh, like recognize it, like it, it it's able to detect the barcode, but it's not recognizable. It will tell you that this was not not recognized, right? Uh, actually, about this. Uh, it um, the recognition process like when the application picks a barcode, uh, then uh, then it's uh, <laughs> the identification process is very quick because 
all the application basically does is just looks looks it up uh, on DuckDuckGo. So uh, internet-wise, it's just few bytes that are sent around, and uh, the, this and the and then the algorithm of the application is like very quick. So uh, there is not even there is not even a processing message or anything like that. Uh, when barcode is is captured, it's immediately sent for descript for description, and uh, the resulting description is immediate, immediately uh, read aloud. Uh, and uh, it it works it works like uh, most of, most of the time. You get uh, you get right away uh, therefore the correct description. Sometimes when uh, there is no no uh, correct description on the uh, on the internet. Uh, basically, two scenarios can happen. You either get uh, some something that's uh, completely unrelated to uh, to products or or similar stuff. If at least some uh, search results are are returned by the search engine, and uh, but this is this is usually uh, a clear clearly recognizable garbage. Like uh, you you get uh, you get uh, back. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, some kind of long number or 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 other other weird stuff. It it doesn't happen very often. The more common scenario is that uh, the search engine doesn't return doesn't return any search results at all if if the product cannot be found online. And uh, in the, and in that case, uh, our scan will simply uh, our scan will simply uh, show uh, show in the search list. Uh, the type of the of the barcode and uh, then you can you can like assign assign uh, your own your own description to the barcode uh, i have an experimental version of rscan developed that uh, continues that that continues this uh, scenario further and uh, and the the reason for this was that uh, I, I was facing uh, I was facing the situation because, as I mentioned before, uh, most of most of items in in my location can be recognized and identified by Arscan right away. But there is there is a certain a certain uh, class of of products that uh, that uh, sort of is avoiding the uh, public detection. Uh, the, the, like mo mostly. Mostly things that uh, are very very special and uh, and unordinary that uh, they are hard to uh, that they are hard to find online. And for these scenarios, I have implemented an experimental feature in RScan that uh, if you scan if you scan uh, a barcode and uh, there is no meaningless result. I mean, you get a beep, so you know that the application has picked up something. But uh, there is no meaningless description. Uh, then you can just uh, you can just shake your uh, shake your device, and uh, our scan will automatically will automatically start uh, start uh, lo lookout for you, and uh, you can use lookout for uh, for the for the determining what are you holding in your hand. So like what is it, and when you know it, then you close the lookout. And as you and the, the system will automatically return you to the RScan application, and RScan will notice that you have that you have closed a lookout, and and will automatically ask you by speech recognition uh, what what was what the thing that you were scanning, and then you can just tell it uh, tell it uh, what you find out it was. And it will automatically assign assign a label for that barcode. So if you, if you scan it in the future, you will get right away, right away the, your the, the description. So this, this is an this is an experimental feature that's uh, that's not yet available in the in the Arscan version that you can find uh, in the Google Play. Uh, it's 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 in its own branch. In the GitHub repository, so for people who have who have experience uh, with uh, compiling Android applications, they can already try it out. I think I have even distributed distributed uh, the experimental versions as APK APK in the Czechoslovak community. But uh, 
it, it, yes, it, it's not something that would be published just yet, but it, it, I'm aware of this of this scenario as well, and um, and uh, it's it's probably it's likely going to land as a feature in in the upcoming releases. So you said if there is no label for the barcode, what can be done is the once a person adds a label to the barcode, you can make like a database and store it on your side somewhere. So whenever there's an update to that uh, database, someone adds a new barcode label, the app can automatically download that database and it can look locally first to see if that uh, barcode exists in the database and then go to DuckDuckGo. Also, can you change the lookout from DuckDuckGo to Google? Let's say I there is no such country, but if there is a country that is blocked DuckDuckGo, then they can change to Google. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, first, first to answer your question regarding the uh, the local database. Uh, so when you are manually assigning uh, manually assigning labels to barcodes, uh, then there are stored uh, these descriptions are stored locally locally uh, uh, on your phone, and uh, they have always uh, they have always uh, like uh, they are always preferred over search search results from DuckDuckGo. So if you have if you have assigned at some point a uh, description to a barcode, uh, then it will be all and, and you scan that barcode in the future, it will be it will be automatically read aloud uh, without uh, without even even doing uh, uh, an internet search. So this 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 is the way it currently works. Unfortunately uh, right now there is no uh, there is no uh, right now, there is no uh, synchronization of the local database, uh, so which is something that I do recognize as a, as a problem. Uh, so you you cannot like easily easily synchronize uh, your 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 barcode description with your other devices, and the reason why this is still not in place, uh, despite being a quite important feature, is that uh, back in the times in the time. When I was developing RScan in the high school, I I couldn't I couldn't uh, afford uh, uh, a server that could that could run like uh, that like some something that could store and provide the same thing synchronization uh, for 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 the users. But uh, now I already do have I already do have my own server. So yes, it this is something this is something I'm definitely. Uh, planning on working on and uh, is very very high on my on my to do list actually i think it's it's the most you know, it's, it's the first is the first thing i'm going to be uh, working on for for next updates so yes uh, i'm keeping this in mind and as regards as, as regarding the uh, search search uh, engines dagdago the reason why dagdago is there are two reasons basically. First of all, uh, uh, is the usability and privacy. Uh, the usability part is that uh, DuckDuckGo is very friendly to automatic uh, uh, automatic queries by programs, while Google uh, Google is can be more aggressive uh, when it when it gets to uh, be you know get getting. Results by applications and uh, and automatic queries. So DuckDuckGo is uh, is is more like uh, pro program program friendly, and also uh, by quality quality testing. I have well, because my 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 most important my most important worry was that uh, whether whether the search results of DuckDuckGo and Google will be of comparable quality. But uh, I really found out uh, that uh, while I personally do not have very good experience using DuckDuckGo as an ordinary search engine, that uh, uh, I have very my experience with barcodes was actually very very good and uh, completely completely on par with with Google. Uh, so uh, this this and and then there, there is also the the DuckDuckGo privacy factor that. Uh, it's it's much 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 more friendly at at least in regards 
to their uh, privacy policy and uh, other other conditions. Right now, I'm not sure if if there are countries that are blocking that, that go, uh, but uh, I I will check it out. I check it out. I I know I know some services are are blocked, but I was not aware that that, that go is among them. So I will check that out. But uh, uh, anyway, I at some point I wanted to, I wanted to introduce. Uh, uh, an option, an option for the users to uh, to use Tor network for uh, connecting to the DuckDuckGo for privacy for privacy reasons. Uh, so there, so their uh, pro pro products product scanning uh, couldn't uh, could, would be like better protected from privacy point of view. So and this this was also this would this would also uh, uh, re resolve partially partially uh, the connectivity issues. Of course, there there would be there would be another problem that uh, if you have country where where Tor is blocked, then uh, well you have basically the same issue. But uh, Tor already do have do has uh, mechanisms for for avoiding this like. The Tor bridges and and uh, other solutions. So, in, in other words, like yes, I I I do realize uh, that there are countries where that that go maybe possibly blocked or or in bad position. But at the same time, if you are facing uh, a similar situation, then you are probably in 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 you need a more that there are more things that you need to carry about and uh, and resolve as a consequence of that. So this is just a point. Right now, no country is blocking DuckDuckGo. This was just my assumption. Like, uh, if tomorrow something mm -hmm. blocks, it can be changed to Google or some different uh, search engine mm -hmm. or that. Because right now, it's not blocked. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see. Yes, I see. Uh, the the actually the the architecture the, the application architecture is uh, is prepared to be flexible. So in in terms of of, of the code and the, of the programming code of the application, uh, that that is prepared for for any changes. So yes, if, if anything happens, it it should be very easy to to implement uh, to implement uh, workarounds. For this, perhaps, perhaps one more thing that I would like to mention uh, regarding the automatic identi identification that was not mentioned yet is that uh, I have previously I have previously uh, mentioned that uh, for the algorithm, uh, in order to because you know when you when you search a barcode on a, on the internet, uh, then you get uh, basically you get uh, all range all range of of results of, because for the search engine the barcode is just some weird number so you get several several results uh, containing the product the product that you are looking for but then you are getting also also some other unrelated nonsense uh, or simply random hits that happen to contain some kind of similar number that to what you are searching for, and R scan R scan is basically uh, selecting from from this list uh, what it thinks to be the most appropriate uh, uh, this description. It it gets it's mostly right, but uh, as I mentioned before, this process is very uh, very uh, dependent on uh, on the local local unit uh, units used. Uh, used in the in the country that where you are uh, where where you are uh, ha having this these products. So, uh, for example, in uh, and and given the the uh, program is developed is being developed in Europe, then uh, it's designed to to recognize uh, European uh, uh, European uh, units. That means. Uh, like kilograms, grams, and uh, meters, and uh, and and more. I think there are actually. I think I have actually listed them. Listed them in the readme of the project. So, uh, but uh, it doesn't contain yet 
uh, units from other parts of the world. Most importantly, m- most importantly, United States and the UK that use completely different unit systems. So uh, uh, I would really, I would really love to. Uh, tell this way that uh, if there are any users from these countries of Arscan, uh, if you are not getting a, a super fitting description, then that's then it's not it may not be the mistake of the algorithm, but simply the consequence that it doesn't contain the it's not made for the local units just yet. And uh, in such case, I would really, I would really love to uh, hear from you and uh, receive feedback because it it absolutely can be done to work. Uh, I just need, I just need some some actual some actual data from from these from these parts of the of the world. Uh, so I could I could tu- tune fi- I could fine tune the algorithm as as good as as possible. Well, thank you so much, Rastislav. This has been absolutely beautiful uh, process getting to know about our scan and all of that. And I'm so glad that you actually took your time to come on and talk to us about it. Uh, you know, how do people reach you? Would they uh, send you feedback um, on your website or uh, could they send you feedback from the app? Or if someone wants to reach you, how do they get hold of you? Uh, thank, thank you also uh, again for for the invitation. Uh, it's really great to be in this podcast and uh, talking about uh, about my app and, and in the production. And uh, yes, the contact information uh, uh, on my uh, on my GitHub. The the most the the best way to contact me is uh, through my through my email address, uh, which is rastislaw.kish at protonmail.com. You can also find this uh, application uh, on my uh, GitHub profile. Although I think I think uh, that uh, you need to be you need to be locked in to actually see the address uh, on the GitHub website. Uh, but those those of you who can use Git can just clone the repository and see in in the commits uh, the address and. Uh, but, but yes, if, if you don't, then then you can you can just log into GitHub and, and see the address, and uh, and that that that's uh, that's the most most re- reliable reliable way of of contacting me because I'm checking my emails regularly and uh, therefore I can j- just see it right away. Great. You know, we'll put that email address in our show notes so that if someone wants to reach you. <laughs> Uh, they'll find that email there in our show notes. So, guys, if you want to reach Restless Lab, look at our show notes and be able to send him feedback there. And so, um, and carry on from there. And if you're here in the States or in the UK, you know, we encourage you to install it. And in this way, we could give him um, feedback uh, to know how it works or what is not working here, most especially with our measurement units and all of that. So, but really, we thank you so much that you took your time to come on and talk about our scan. I am going to be playing with it a lot today, being home alone. Uh, <laughs> time for the mouse to come out and play. <laughs> Cats are gone. <laughs> uh, so uh, definitely, I'm going to be playing with it. And then I'll be recording a little app demo for our next episode, App of the Week. You are now on to our App of the Week segment. This is where we demonstrate an app showing you whether or not it has accessibility issues or not. Should you have an app that you would like us to feature on one of our episodes, feel free to send such an app to contact us at blindandroidusers.com. And now, here's this episode's App of the Week. And now we move on to our next segment, and this is the App of the Week. And this week, I'm demonstrating an app called Noto, N-O-T-O. Hi, 
Warren Carr here for Blind Android Users Podcast and for episode 159 app of the week. This is demonstrating a note-taking app called Noto, N-O-T-O. El Noto, just to put a little Espanol in there to be fair. For today's demonstration, I'll be using my Pixel 8 Pro, running Android 14 and TalkBack 14.1. In the way of a TTS engine, I'm using the multilingual TTS engine, which utilizes the Google Speech Services. I do want to apologize here in advance because you may hear some honking going on because we have the Christmas light parade going on in my little town where we have a lot of decorated trucks going by. They've gone past my street quite a while ago, but I can still hear those honks now and then out there. And now with that out of the way, let's go ahead and show you how to use Noto. Again, I do want to mention here in passing that Noto is a note-taking app. This is totally something that can be used offline, has no need for accessing the internet. It's just locally on your device. And besides, it has no ads. And that's all that there is to this app. It's also an open source app and can also be found on GitHub. Let's now go ahead and navigate to Nodo, and I have it sitting right here on the home screen. Nodo. Here's Nodo. I'll tap to activate. Nodo. Nodo. Allow Nodo to send you notifications. Allow. Button. The first thing we heard is to allow Nodo, or whether or not we want to allow it to send us notifications. I'm notorious for not letting things send me notifications. And so for me, though, I'm going to tap on Do Not Allow It. Now, if you want to be seeing notifications at your end, go ahead and tap to allow the seeing of notifications from Nodo. I'll tap on Do Not Allow. Don't Allow button. There we go. I'll tap. Nodo. Zero folders. We are now in the menu eye of the app, and the first thing we heard is zero folders. I do want to mention here that though toward the half part of the phone, just starting from the left, you're going to see some folders and all of that. Those are pre-made folders, but I have no folders of my own. Therefore, I have zero folders. To the right edge of the phone, just above those folders, we do have some buttons that starting from the left going to the right, and I'm, I'm talking about starting from the middle of the phone. It's not like on the left edge, but in the middle of the phone and going to the right edge. We've got some buttons here that I want to show you before we proceed from here. Here are the little buttons that we got. Folders view button. We have one called Folders View, and then to the right of that, Settings button. We have Settings. And the last and third item to the right is More Options. More Options button. Before we come back to these buttons to see what the settings is all about or what the more options is all about, let's look at what those are the folders, the pre-made folders that we have that I talked about earlier. And so starting from the left in the middle of the phone, here's what we got. All notes, all, zero, in list. It says all notes, all, zero. And to the right of that, these are arranged left and right. All notes, recent, zero. All notes, recent, zero. Then, below the all notes, we got... All notes, scheduled, zero. And then going to the right of that... All notes, archived, zero. And the last column, starting from the left... General, general, zero. And that's all we have there. Now, at the very bottom right corner of the phone, we have a button that simply says... Create folder, button, out of list. Create a folder. So if I wanted to create a folder, for example, and I want to call it maybe blind Android users or whatever it is, let's just go ahead and do that. But before we do that, though, let's go back up to the top and look at those three buttons that I talked about earlier. That is the folders view, settings, and the more options buttons that we saw earlier above these folders. Let's start, though, with the folder view. Folders view button. 
Here is Folders View. If I tap... Noto. Folders View. When you tap on Folders View, then toward the bottom of the phone, it pops up a little menu. And here's what we got. Sorting. Sorting. Creation date. We have the first thing, sorting, and by default is creation date. If you tap here, though, you could go choose on how you want to sort this. You notice, though, that it reads it twice for some reason. So that's one of the pitfalls of this app if it doesn't bother you. Next. Ordering. Ordering. Descending. And then we hear the ordering, and by default is descending. And moving on. Apply. Button. At the bottom of the phone is an apply button. That's if you've chosen anything at all, then you tap the apply to apply the choices you've just made. That's the last item here. I'm going to go back. Noto. Folders view. Button. Next, let's move on to the settings, which is to the right of the folders view. And I'll move my finger to the right. Settings. Button. Here is settings, and we tap to activate settings. Noto. Back. Button. Tapping on settings, the first thing we heard was back button found at the top left corner of the phone. And moving my finger down, here's what we encounter. Settings. I hear settings. Move my finger down again. General. General. It says general and... It says it twice. Now, if I tap in here, though, I probably see some things in here. Let's go ahead and tap. Back button. Tapping on general, we heard back button. Now, moving my finger down. General. That's the header. Main interface. Main interface. All folders. The first screen displayed when launching the app. And moving down. Quick note folder. Quick note folder. General. The default folder when saving a note using. Quick note, text selection option. Next. Theme. Theme. Follow system plus dark. I'm not going to go into all of these things, but simply just going through them so you can hear what they are all about. Uh, because if I decide to go into each and every one of these, it's going to take us a long time. So let's just go down the list. Language. Language. Follow system. Next. Icon. Icon. Futuristic. Next. Show notes count. Show notes count. Whether to display the count of notes in the folders dialog. Next. Remember scrolling position. Remember scrolling position. Whether to store the scrolling position in folders and notes. So in other words, if you wanted to remember where you left while you are reading something or where you've scrolled to, by default, you know, these things have check marks or switches to the right of them for some reason. Of course, uh, the screen reader is not reading those, but you can... Uh, just play with it to see what you see or what you get. Next. Quick exit. Quick exit. Whether to exit the app immediately when pressing the back button. Next. Notes font. Notes font. Nunito default. If you don't like that, you could tap there to go change it. Next. Continuous search. Continuous search. Whether to pass the search term to the note screen. So continuous search, I think what that means is that if I'm searching something in a particular note for a particular word, and if I wanted it to affect other notes that I have, I think that's what that is. Next. Preview auto scroll. Preview auto scroll. Whether to enable auto scroll for notes in preview mode. And that's the last item here. Now I'm going to go back. Back. Button. I'm back to the previous screen where we tapped on general. Now, below general, we've got reading mode, reading mode. We have the reading mode. Next. Vault, vault. Vault. So, in other words, this is an area where you can go in and set up the vault. That is an area where you want to put personal or secret stuff that you don't want anyone to see, you could go in here and set a password or create a vault for such things. Next. Export import data. Export import data. You could export or import data. Next. Share Noto with others. Share Noto with others. Share Noto with others. Rate Noto on Play Store. Rate Noto on Play Store. You can rate it on the Play Store. What's new? What's new? What's new? Next. Report an issue. Report an issue. 
And about 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 support Nodo support Nodo and support Nodo. Now let's go back to the previous screen. General zero notes. I hit the back button and it places us in the general. And I do want to mention here in passing that when that happens, you have some buttons at the bottom here to the bottom left. You've got folders button. Folders. And if you tap on that folders, then it takes us back to the main UI where we saw the buttons that we're working on. That is the folders view settings and the last one that we're going to look at, which is the more options. Now, while we're still here to the right of that is the create note. Create note button. Create note and to the right of that. General archive button. General archive. Search button. Search to the right of that and the last button. Folder options button. Is folder options. Now I'll tap on folders button. Folders on the bottom left. Noto zero folders. So I'm back to that screen where we tapped on the settings and now to the right edge of the phone there to the right of the settings is the last button which will be the more options. More options button. Tapping on more options. Noto folders vault. The first thing again we heard is folders vault and moving to the right of it. Folders archive. Folders archive. Settings. We hear settings again. That's all that we have here. Now, if we tap on that settings, it will take us to the settings that we were in earlier. So I'm not going to tap on settings again. I'll go back. Noto. Folders. Button. Now, understand that as I went back, we are back on folders again. So I'm in that area where we have those buttons, folders, create. Node, uh, search, folders, options, and things like that. Let's go ahead though and tap on create note, and that's at the bottom there in the middle. Create note button. And I tap. Body, general, zero words. Tapping on it, you know, it says I'm um, in the body and it says Showing zero English, words. US QWERTY. And of course, pops up my keyboard at the bottom of the screen. Putting my finger Access down. Created just now. It says created just now. Body. Edit box. Editing. The body is editing. And I'm going to move my finger to the left to get to the title. Title. Edit box. I'm going to tap here to create a title. Title. And I'll dictate something using the assistant. Assistant voice typing. N-O-T-O. First. Test. Next. Hello, comma. This is a test using an app called NOTO, period, new paragraph. I am demonstrating this for the Blind Android Users Podcast, period, new paragraph. This concludes the testing of the NOTO note taking app, period. Stop. Voice typing stopped. So I just dictated the title and then I told it to move to the next, which moved me to the body of the note. And now I'm going to double check those to make sure that indeed what I dictated is in there. So I put my finger near the top. General, 32 words. It says I had 32 words. Move my finger down. Create label button in list. Uh, something called create label. I could tap here to create a label. So if I want to call it blind Android users or whatever, I'll give it that label. Now move my finger down. Noto first test. Edit box. Title. Out of list. There we have our title. Noto first test. And moving my finger down to the body. Hello. This is a test using an app called Noto. I am demonstrating this for the blind Android users podcast. This concludes the testing of the Noto not taking app. Edit box. Editing. Body. I think it missed one word in there instead of note. I, I heard the word not. Anyway, but that's how it works. 
Now, I'm going to see if this thing allows me to either read character by character, line by line, basically using the granularity and editing. For example, I want to correct that word not to not. Links. I swipe up and Controls. down again. Headings. Headings. Paragraphs. Paragraphs. Lines. Lines. I'm going to swipe up. This concludes the testing of the Noto Not Taking app. Okay, I'm going to change to words. Words. This concludes the testing of the Noto Not. All right, now I'm going to change here. I'm going to put letter E at the end here, I believe, because I'm at the end of this uh, word N O T. It should be N O T E. E. All right, I'm going to try to. Hello, this is a note. There we go. Noto. Noto. Note. There we go. I just corrected that. And that's a quick overview of the Noto, N O T O, note taking app, L Noto. Thanks for listening. And now, the G Show, or what Austin refers to as the Joshua Screen Reader, aka Commentary Screen Reader CSR. This is where some feature of this screen reader is demonstrated. Straight up now, we have our next segment in the way of the CSR, G Show Screen Reader, Commentary Screen Reader, Joshua Screen Reader, if you are Austin, and Karine brings us this week's entry of the CSR entry. Hi. By default, when you are using Joshua Screen Reader, if you press the volume up key, you are increasing the media volume, and if you press the volume down key, you are decreasing it. If the screen reader volume is linked to the media volume, this will mean, of course, that you are increasing and decreasing the, media, the screen reader volume as well. If you are using accessibility volume for Jishuo, if you want to increase or decrease the accessibility volume or the screen reader volume, you have to put your finger on the screen, and while the finger is on the screen, you press either the volume up key to increase accessibility volume or the volume down key to decrease it. Recently, Jishuo included a new addition, which is the ability to put a finger on the screen and then press and hold one of the volume keys. Let's see when the screen is unlocked, what will happen if I put my finger on the screen and press and hold the volume up key. 68. This increased the speech rate. If I put my finger on the screen and I keep it on the screen, then press and hold the volume down key, I will be 63. decreasing the speech rate. So this controls the speech rate when the screen is unlocked. Screen locked. If I'm on the lock screen, the behavior will be different. If I put my finger on the screen and then press and hold the volume up key, I will be restarting the TTS engine that I'm using. And if I put my finger on the screen and press and hold the volume down key, I will be switching to the next available TTS engine. I will uh, try to use uh, or to put my finger on the screen and press and hold the volume down key. 2301. I'm on the lock screen. The currently used TTS engine has been switched to speak. Again. The currently used TTS engine has been switched to flight hack. Again. The currently used TTS engine has been switched Samsung text to speech engine slash com dot Samsung dot SMT. If you are using the free version, the choice or the number of TTS Screen engines locked. that you can switch to will be very limited. However, uh, if you are using the pro version, this should uh, switch between all the available TTS engines that you have on your phone. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Karen.
uh, actually find this thing to be really interesting. And I, I keep hoping and hoping, hope upon hope, let me say that, uh, that this thing would come on to the Play Store and I'll be having a party with you now that you have a better internet connectivity, Karen. So I'm looking forward to when I can jump on a bandwagon of the Confused Crane Reader. Now, you can bring the uh, pitchforks and cut my head off. You would wait and wait and wait, and you will still be stuck with your talk back <laughs> until the oh, there, she, there she goes. <laughs> oh, Karen, thank you so much for these um, uh, entries for the CSR. These are great, and uh, no wonder a lot of people like it because you had a lot of uh, customizations uh, going on for this uh, thing, which is really good. But let's be honest. Let's be honest, Warren. You, if it came to the Play Store, you would play with it for a couple of days, and then you'd be go running back to Google and start using Talkback again. Totally agree. <laughs> that was I don't great. know, John. <laughs> Being uh, frankly, uh, I think if anything that would make me go back, though, it would probably because of the too many, um, you know. I think it takes too much to set up. And for me, when I'm using an app, if it involves too much of, you know, doing this and that, it kind of wears me off after a while. You could keep things on their defaults, actually, because whenever you have a screen reader, it should be so much customizable. Yeah, a lot of users could keep things on their defaults, but it's good to have customization, which is what TalkBack slightly lacks. It is good to have customization. And you know what? What I really like about it the most in your demonstration, Karen, is that ability to change uh, TTS engine on the fly because this is a huge, huge thing in my never to be humble opinion because we've heard so many stories or so many incidences with people using TalkBack whereupon they've chosen a TTS engine that has no data or voice data and then they're left in the cold until they find some sighted person to help them out. And so for me, uh, to be able to just know how to change that uh, so when you are in a bind, it's just a breeze. So uh, kudos to the guy who did this CSR uh, my hat's off to that guy. That's absolutely brilliant. And if there's anything, one single thing I would like to talk back to learn is to be able to implement something of this nature, which is very important. Also, also uh, the Tisho screen reader, unlike Talkback, has uh, has automatic like back, ne network backup of its configuration. So uh, yes, uh, the initial the initial setup uh, can be a pain. But uh, then, when you are all, when you are done tweaking to your liking, then uh, uh, as far as you have a license, then uh, it will just it will just automatically automatically uh, set up itself whenever you install the screen reader on on your phones and devices. So there is no need to repeat all that all that uh, process uh, and every. That's good. So it has an auto backup. So, Rusty Slobber, I think you're also a CSR user. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that kind of makes Sally happy, you know, the yeah, kind of CSR yeah, boy. Yeah, sure. You know, what someone screen reader should, user. Yeah. you know what someone should make, though, is like a a backup or a configuration file with like the gesture schemes and settings that are most like. Now, obviously, it can't be it's exactly so, like, but that are most that. like talkback. So that somebody coming over from Talkback could be able to use it almost the same, and then go in and customize it from there to their liking. I think that if that doesn't already exist, that would be uh, something cool. I think that would get me so uh, is... on to John. Uh... <laughs> There's something in the works uh, which started in the latest version, which is to to be able to export all of the settings and stuff then uh, you will be able to share them. However, until now, it's just uh, a first step. We could say that it is it is just uh, like compressing the uh, the folder of G-Show, so it's not doing really something important. However, when it is developed more, if he, if he cares about it more and do and does more, more development, 
uh, it will be something great. So people could just export their uh, settings and stuff and people, other people could import them. I think actually that would help a lot of people to adopt CSR because I think that's the major hurdle for them is the starting point is so different from what they're used to. If they could just import settings and gestures and stuff, um, even if it was part of the setup, you know, that first setup that goes through asks you what type of navigation you want um, and that sort of thing. If it would just ask you if, if you want to import talkback settings, that'd be kind of cool. And of course, when it's done, uh, of course, you'll hear it here first. Karen will definitely bring that to us as an entry from CSR. Straight Ahead is our Tip of the Week segment, and this is where we show you a trick or tip on how to take advantage of your Android device. And now for this episode's Tip of the Week, here's your Tip of the Week. Up next, we close the episode with a tip of the week, and this has to do with the messaging app and those pesky OTPs that you get. Here is our tip of the week. Hi, Warren Carr here for BAU Podcast, and for episode 159 tip of the week, this is showing you how to go about enabling the auto-deletion of OTPs. OTPs are those one-time passcodes that you get from banks, services, and or some other things that you sign up for. Now, over time, those things accumulate and get backed up onto your Google Drive. Today, however, I'll show you how to automatically delete those things within 24 hours after you receive them, and that's what this tip of the week is all about. Here's how we go about doing or enabling the auto-deletion of those pesky OTPs. Step one, we are now in messages. And the first thing we want to do is tap on your username on the top right corner of the phone. I'll now find the top right corner where it says my username and tap there. Signed in as Warren Car Work Air at Here's where we tap. Account and settings. Close. Next, step two is to find an item that says messages settings. I'll now find and tap on Messages Settings. Messages Settings, two of three. Here is Messages Settings, and we tab here to activate. General Settings, now. Step number three is to tap on an item that is nestled between theme settings, that is the themes of the app, and country selection. And the item we're after is an item called Message Organization. I'll now put my finger down and tap on Message Organization. Message Organization. Here is Message Organization. Let's go ahead and tap. Message Organization. Navigate up. Button. Step 3. Next, we want to tap on an item that says Auto-delete OTPs after 24 hours. Current and future OTPs will be permanently deleted after 24 hours. Switch. On. In other words, this by default is not turned on, but right now mine is turned on because I have enabled OTP deletion. If this is the first time that you're coming in here, however, it's going to say switched off. So you could tap here to enable it. It's just the right edge of the phone there, about an inch and a half from the top. Once you tap on that, you have enabled the auto deletion of OTPs. And now you know how to go about the auto-deletion of those pesky OTPs that you receive. And that's our tip of the week for episode 159. So about the OTPs automatic deleting, uh, Google did the trick again, and it's not available for uh, most of the world. So you just need to wait for Google to push it the rest of the world. I checked it today to see if it's available in my messaging app, and it's not. That is such a shame. That is such yeah. a shame. I, I wonder yeah. why that is. You know, you can't, 
<laughs> there are so many things that it's kind of like a mystery what's going on. You cannot on. trust Google. No. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, let's I was just mad get when they took away my message Google. organization. I liked having all of my messages that were like from contacts in one page and not having like all the other random text messages that I get on that same page. So they took that away for some reason. I don't have that anymore. That's interesting, John. I don't know why they took that uh, message organization away because I remember, you know, you have uh, personal, you have whatever business. And if you tap on that, you see the messages that are from your contacts, you tap on that. I really like that. But I think they did away with that maybe what, like a couple months or maybe even three. I don't remember the last time that I saw that. And it's, yeah, that's another silly thing that Google does. And like I've always said, it seems like we've got a bunch of kids there that are constantly, you know, tweaking things. Eh, I'm bored with this. I'm done with it. It's just unbelievable. All good things must end. Thus, it's curtain drawing time, bringing us to the close of this week's episode. Coming up, though, we give you information on how to get hold of us. And with that, though, we come to the end of this week's episode. We're looking forward to seeing you next week when we will bring you the last episode for 2023. For now, though, we'll just hand it over to Austin to give you information on how people can contact us. To contact us, you can send an email to contact us at blindandroidusers.com. You can join a mailing list by sending an email to blind android users plus subscribe at groups.io you can join our telegram facebook discord and subscribe to our youtube channel the links for everything will be at the bottom of the show notes and also in the video description of the youtube channel and also the links are in the websites panel of the youtube channels and that's it. Thank you so much, Austin. And we come to the end of this episode. Looking forward to seeing you next week. From my end, I want to say Merry Christmas, guys. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you next week. And goodbye from me. Merry Christmas, everyone. Have a safe Christmas. And whatever holiday you celebrate, the Jewish people, they celebrate Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah the, on the 26th. So have a safe holiday. And we'll see you at the last episode of the year. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Vesele Vianoce a šťastný nový rok. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Blind Android Users Podcast. Until we see you next week, don't forget to leave us your comments and suggestions via our email contact or using any of our social media sites. Have a great week.